Right. Hello, everyone. I am Alex Lim, and welcome to Author Story, the home of authors and stories that matter. This episode's featured guest is Melissa De La Cruz, author of Never After the Thirteenth Fairy. So, Melissa, welcome to Author Story. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So, yeah. So, first off, a little bit about background. Uh, you're from the Philippines. You emigrated to the United States, teenager. Uh, and you're now a writer. So did you ever want to become an author even before you emigrated? Absolutely. I've been wanting to be a writer since I was about eight years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when I was 11, uh, still living in Manila, Mm -hmm. I read an article uh, about uh, Francine Pascal, Mm -hmm. who wrote a series called Sweet Valley High. Right. And uh, the article was about how, while Francine created the series, the uh, writers of the books were actually these 22-year-old ghost writers. Uh, mm-hmm. They were uh, recent college graduates who wrote the books, and their names were not on the cover, but they were on the first page. So it would say, created by Francine Pascal, written by you know Kate Marshall. Right. And I was 11. I thought, oh my goodness, you know, when uh, I'm 22, which is 11 years from now, right. perhaps I an author as well because until then I thought all authors were either 90 years old or dead (laughs) okay right right okay and uh, yeah so after that uh, you became a journalist and editor before you published your first novel I mean you've had a lot of experiences haven't you I mean you took you you, uh, even took jobs like being a nanny Uh, every now and then you worked for Morgan Stanley so it's a it's a very varied route you take so to Took, so to speak. I was never a nanny. I oh, okay. babysat a few children. <laughs> oh, okay, my mistake. Okay, correct. Yeah. That corrected. Yeah. A lot of marketing. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, because I wrote a book called The Au Pairs, but I was never an au pair myself. But right. um, yeah, I wanted to be a writer. I was always writing, um, mm-hmm. but I was working for Morgan Stanley. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I sold my first book, uh, I uh, started writing full time. Right. Okay. And I mean, uh, this is uh, what it's like for you. I mean, you you first your first printed work was uh, an essay in New York Press in 1996. Uh, what was what is it like for you having realizing you know I could maybe do this you know? Yeah. I mean, it was huge. Um, I've always wanted to be a writer, and getting my first published article was really validating. Um, and then selling my first novel about. Mm, so 1996, about three years after that, I sold my first novel, and I always joke that um, you know it was the third happiest day of my life mm-hmm. after my wedding and the birth of my child. But in reality, uh, to be perfectly honest, it was the happiest day of my life when I discovered <laughs> I've been <was> published. <laughs> all right, but husband and kid don't need to know that. <laughs> okay, all right, cool, cool. And you were you were an editor and a journalist. Um, did did being either of those help you hone your craft because when you by become when uh, you became a writer? Um, I don't think it was so much about honing the craft. Um, I was advised to uh, look into journalism when I was selling my first novel. Oh, cool. uh, which, uh, Was not um, which uh, my first book that I ever wrote was actually not published. It was my third novel uh-huh. that I wrote became my first published novel. Okay. So uh, an editor at Simon & Schuster uh, told me, you know, it's hard to sell something if people haven't seen your work, you know, in small, you know, areas. You have to show that you can uh, write professionally and that you can fill a de- meet a deadline. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of um, fell into it that way. You know, it was not a dream to be a journalist. It was a path to mm-hmm. getting uh, my name out there and my novel published. Mm, right, right. And I, I don't know how much experience you've had with other novelists, but is this the sort of thing that novelists would have to do nowadays to get their to get their books published? I don't know. You know, this was about 25 years ago. Okay. Um, uh, the world has certainly changed now. Um, there's blogging. There's creating mm-hmm. your own website. You know, there's making your own audience. You know, through Instagram or Twitter, um, right. having your own platform. Uh, and there's self-publishing, which is, uh, you know, an avenue that you could uh, try if traditional publishing uh, doesn't work out. So uh, mm-hmm. I think it's always good to 
write professionally and get your name out there and see how readers react to your words. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't know. I think uh, there's a lot more uh, opening as well, you know, just in what they're publishing. Children's publishing has grown so mm -hmm. much. 25 years uh, since, so I, I think there's a lot more opportunity to just jump in with a full book. So I don't think you need to be a journalist before then. Things, right. Things are <laughs> Right, okay, okay, all right. So you've written a lot of books. I mean, I counted uh, something like over 20 books, I think. How long does it take you really to write out a book? Because I mean, this is uh, this a uh, sizable body of work you've got. Uh, my favorite author is Enid Blyton, uh, who is a children's author who wrote, I think, 400 or 500 books. Mm. Uh, so I've written about 63. Okay. Uh, I think about my books for a long time, so even though there's a lot out there, um, first of all, I write for children. Okay, okay. And children's okay. series uh, usually publish, I had a couple of series that were publishing about twice a year. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, instead of, you know, an adult kind of literary schedule where, you know, you're writing one book, uh, you know, maybe even every five years or every, you know, genre, airport mm -hmm. thrillers, usually once a year, uh -huh. you know, I publish about four to five books a year. So that's oh, why okay. there's a big uh, number, which is not that uh, rare in the children's uh, book industry. Uh, so, you know, um, I probably think about my books for several years, you know, and then I start writing the idea, and then from the idea to an outline, from the outline to a first draft, you know, it can take anywhere from six weeks to three months to six, six months, mm -hmm. and then another three to six months to edit them, but I can work on several different books at the same time. Right, and you brought up an interesting something interesting because I never did consider this before. So from what you tell me, it seems that the pacing for uh, children's or maybe young adult books, particularly when there's a series that's involved, it's the, the process is different compared to say uh, a book, an adult book. I mean, a book for you know adults. Um, I I can't talk about. <laughs> I mean, I've written uh, several adult books, and the process was actually the same okay. for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Because because uh, I thought you know you'd really have like you know I w when you told me about how how many books you had to write out, I was thinking like you're jamming down the laptops and working so hard that the laptop starts smoking. You know. <laughs> no, I mean I wouldn't do this if it wasn't easy for me. Mm. I can write fast um and uh i'm not working all the time i think if you okay. worked all the time burnt out i work when uh you know when uh it's easy when the writing is going well i can write uh, a lot in a short time mm -hmm. all right okay all right so what is it about uh your audience i mean you you as you mentioned children young adults What's about your audience that makes you want to write to them, you know, write stories, that, the kind of stories that they would like to read? Um, you know, I, uh, I'm interested in uh, stories that interest uh, that same age group. You know, I feel mm -hmm. like when you write for kids, you never really grow up yourself. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm very much in touch with um, the kid that I used to be. Uh, and I'm having that uh, sympathy and that feeling and talking to other um, children's book writers, you know, we're all kind of the same. We're all, you know, we never really grew up. And I think by that, I mean, we always empathize with kids. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing to see how many adults are so not interested in teenagers or are afraid of them, you know, mm -hmm. and when I go on tour, to uh, schools, you know, they all apologize for the kids and say, oh, I'm so sorry, you have to talk to them. I'm like, right. I love talking to kids, you know. I, I would always be on the side of the kids over, um, you know, kind of uh, administrators or teachers. Okay. <laughs> and I think that's part of my sensibility. I see, okay, all right. And I mean, you, you've done pretty well. So you mentioned over 60 books, so that's uh, that's quite a bit. I mean, I'm sure you've gotten uh, you've gotten quite a big following among that that demographic. <laughs> okay, so uh, in terms of uh, putting in the book, because I know that sometimes authors, when they write out books, they write novels, even heck, when they write reports, they, there's some stuff that they want to put in, and there's some stuff they need to leave out. 
were you able are you able to get everything into the books that you write that you want to put in absolutely oh, great. Um, I would do this if I didn't mm -hmm. um, I uh, you know I put in stuff that I think is really interesting uh, personally I think we all write if you're a writer you write for yourself and you write to entertain yourself mm -hmm. and I write to make myself laugh so mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> all my jokes are in there. All okay. my ideas are. Yeah, definitely. All right, fantastic. Okay, cool. So, all right. So about uh, about a little bit about the uh, the books themselves. I mean, well, um, actually, something about the scenes themselves. What are some of the most challenging, um, I know, parts of the scenes or parts of the book that you found? You know, you kind of challenged writing. Um. I don't know. I kind of enjoy a lot of it. I think, okay. uh, you know, when I write the action scenes, you know, right. you kind of have to choreograph them and try to make sure that you know where everybody is, where everybody's standing, and mm -hmm. how things are working. So, right. you know, that probably is the most challenging part of it, and writing something that's thrilling both to you and the reader. You know, I think I like to kind of let the story kind of come alive and see where it takes mm. me. Excited and as um, surprised as the reader. Right. Okay. Okay. That, that's interesting because I, I would have thought like you like if you write out a series of books, you really have to get flat. You know, you really have to get uh, straight on. You know what happens here and what happens there because it might have repercussions later on. Or you know, you do some. You might have to write something out in the later book that you think mm, it doesn't really particularly fit with the previous book. Uh, yeah, no, you definitely have to make your story uh, fit the logic that you've already created. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, um, before we get into this, into into your books, I mean, I'm there's with all the books you've written, you know. I mean, okay. So we've heard about writer's block. You know, uh, you can't write because uh, you can't move along. But I'd like to ask a question from the other side of the page, so to speak. Have you ever gotten reader's block? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think that, you know, everybody gets a little bit tired, um, you know, uh, of maybe if you're reading all the same kinds of books. But I definitely try to read lots of different kinds of books mm -hmm. so that I'm not uh, bored. Um, okay. And, uh, I read nonfiction. Uh -huh. I read adult novels. I read um, young adult. I read middle grade. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think keeping a variety of uh, of books on hand, you know, keeps you from that reader's block. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay. Got that. Okay. So a little bit about your work. Then I mean, you've covered a wide variety of uh, topics and the different kinds of characters. Like I'm thinking, like, you know, uh, you've done vampires, of course. I mean, <laughs> why not? And uh, you've also done like a uh, setting in the prep school. I think it's called the Ashleys. And you've also uh, done some something about like, like well, okay, au pairs. How do you come up with the ideas for all this? I mean, sure. I mean, your 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 main audience is like uh, children and teens, but you know, this is this this is different kind of stuff like vampires and then uh, prep school and stuff like that. Um, I'm interested in a lot of things. Um, okay. I went to prep school, um, so I take things that you know I know. I lived in New York for many years, so Blue Bloods, my vampire series, was kind of a love letter to New York. Um, okay. And I think creative people, you know, kind of use everything that they're inspired by, and you know, uh, people always ask where you get our ideas. It's like we have ideas all the time. You know, it's mm -hmm. not about getting them it's about figuring out which idea uh is a book that can mm -hmm. be executed in a book. as i tell a lot of people who say oh you should write about that that's a book um mostly the ideas that other people pitch writers are dinner party anecdotes i'm okay. like you know what that's an that's not a novel <laughs> uh-huh uh -huh. okay all right so this is interesting because i mean uh, for, for, i'm not really a writer myself so i'm not familiar with uh, the kind of analogy you put up what do you mean by a, like a dinner story anecdote and how does this relate to it's not being a book you know somebody will say oh this is so interesting this person blah 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 and it's just a little tiny story it's not oh. it doesn't say something about 
you know, um, the bigger environment. It doesn't mm. have a bigger theme. You know, ah. it's like oh, a person. That's it. Okay. okay. So it's sort <laughs> of like, a... okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, that I, I was done. Okay, so so it's something like maybe if if someone type wrote this out, probably just like five or six paragraphs rather than a, you know, a novel that runs for a hundred pages or so. Three hundred pages. All right. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So now on to the book. Like never after, it's intended to be the first book of a new series. So uh, you know, I'm I'm sure a lot of people at the moment aren't familiar with this. So what is this all about? So Never After is my follow-up to my Disney Descendants series. So I spent about five, six years writing uh, Disney fairy tales, and mm -hmm. I discovered I wasn't done with them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write more fairy tales, but, you know, with my own original spin on it. And I discovered that the story of Sleeping Beauty doesn't end with uh, True Love's Kiss and mm -hmm. everybody living happily after after, after she wakes up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually part two to the grim fairy tale where Sleeping Beauty is uh, uh, terrorized by an ogre mother-in-law and there's bloodshed and trauma and the prince is uh, framed for her murder. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's so dark and terrible. I need to write about it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so ever after 12-year-old Philomena discovers that she uh, goes into the world of Never After, which is uh, what she's been reading about in the Never After series. Mm -hmm. And because she's fan of the books uh she knows more about the world than the people who live there so oh, okay. uh, she finds herself in the sleeping beauty story all right okay so first i'd just like to acknowledge our cat is meowing in the background that's her so if you hear a cat meowing that's her <laughs> yeah yeah thank thank goodness this isn't videotaped because i mean her tail would probably be in the camera or something like that <laughs> Okay, so uh, you may, did mention Philomena, and uh, is she the main character in the story, or are there other, like, other main characters that uh, that are in the story? She's the main character, mm -hmm. yeah, but there are some fun supporting characters, uh, like Jack and Alistair, who mm -hmm. are from the Never After world and oh. go on the adventure. Oh, okay, so, and, and uh, what, what, what is this, uh, what is this kind of conflicts that uh, Philomena will come across? I mean... I, granted, I mean, this is like she's going to go into story after story after story, but, you know, what is the sort of thing that uh, she's, that, that would, you know, that would keep her interesting as a character? Well, I think it's interesting that she finds herself in, the, in an adventure. She's a kid who likes to read books and, you know, hasn't really had a lot of life outside of the overprotective shell that her parents have put her in right. and suddenly you know she's battling uh dragons and sorcerers and meeting princesses so yeah she's a lot of fun um mm. very plucky okay all right so this this sounds like a very interesting how how many books i'm just curious how many books in this series do you intend to write because this seems like it could I mean, there are a lot of fairy tales, and you know, the, the, this show seems to show a lot of room for expansion. Yeah. Um, well, uh, publishers tend to buy series books two at a time. I had a okay. series that was about nineteen books. Uh -huh. uh, they did not buy all nineteen in uh -huh. the beginning. They bought two, and then they kept buying two at a time oh. until we got to the end. Uh, so. With Never After, you know, I have a little bit of an open-ended um, idea for how many books it can go to. They bought the first two, and I think they're buying another two, and then we'll see. So hopefully we'll get to write, um, I'll get to write many books in the series. Wow, all right. And do you have any idea about uh, the, the particular fairy tales that will be covered in, these, in, in the series? Um, not really, you know, okay. I kind of... Uh, figure it out as I go along. The first book has a little bit of Sleeping Beauty, a little bit of Aladdin, mm -hmm. and then the second book uh, has a little bit of Cinderella. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, I do plan, but I don't like to plan so far in advance because I like things to surprise me. Mm. Okay, all right, okay, cool. All right, so, all right, so, it, it, so the, the work is uh, more like, I mean, it kind of, how, how do I put this? It's kind of organic. It kind of grows rather than being planned from start to finish. That's, I think it's a little bit of both, definitely. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, you do need to create outlines for books and stories and, you know, for the book and all that stuff. 
I'm an outliner. Uh, I think half of a writers are outliners and half are not outliners. Um, so it's just a different process for everybody. But yeah, I'm an outliner. Okay. All right. So uh, when you were an 11 year old, um, you know, thinking about being an author, did you ever think you'd get this kind of success that you presently have? Um, you know, absolutely. I don't think wow. anybody goes into the arts and thinks they're going to be a failure. <laughs> okay, all right, good point, good point. The arts thinking that you're going to be a great success. I mean, you know, with a lot of ambition, you need so much confidence and so mm -hmm. much, um, you know, spirit and drive uh, to believe in yourself. So you mm -hmm. absolutely have to believe that you're going to do well. Otherwise, there are so many obstacles in your path. You know, nobody around you has taken this path. Um, mm -hmm. There's not this, uh, you know, directions in how to be an author. Everybody comes to it differently. Right. Um, you know, you don't really have to go to school for it. I, mean, I certainly don't uh, recommend paying so much money to be in a career that doesn't uh, guarantee uh, an income. Um, right. You know, it's not like going to law school. Where you get out and you're going to be a lawyer um right. so yeah no i think you definitely have to um and uh, i definitely thought or at least i hoped <laughs> that uh i would do well in it yeah yeah and i mean con considering that i mean for, I, I i i've spoken to a lot of authors and the common thread here is you know persistence because you know, as you mentioned, with your own experience, the first uh, work that you create is not necessarily the one that gets published. I mean, it takes years sometimes and a lot of persistence before before something comes to fruition. Absolutely. And you can be an author at any age. My husband was an architect for many years and had his own firm. Uh, and now he's an author and he's been an author for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and he started uh, uh, right before he was 40. You right. know, he kind of switched careers. Uh, so whereas I had always wanted to be a writer mm -hmm. and start 20s, he started almost, you know, 15 years after me. Uh -huh. um, and uh, he's an author too. So yeah, so don't get discouraged. Don't think there's no time limit on it. You can be an author in your 60s and your 80s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, definitely. All right. Just keep going. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, um, and I just like to ask you one one last question in this interview. They see because they say that experience is the best teacher. Now, if you could go back in time and tell your your younger writer self anything, give the, them any bit of advice that you have learned over the past few years, what would that be? Uh, to give myself advice, um, I think I would say that success, um, you also have to survive success. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because everybody thinks that, oh, it's the failures that you have to watch out for. But I think success sometimes also goes to your head. And I think that's a hard mm -hmm. thing to get over. Um, and the more you can, uh, kind of take away your identity from how your books are doing from the marketplace, mm -hmm. you know, and really think about yourself as a person instead of um, a product, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that really drives some writers crazy is when they, you know, chase the bestseller list, chase the trends, um, you know, kind of uh, get beat themselves up for their books, you know, not doing well. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's just the way to madness. I think you have to enjoy the work. You have to enjoy what you're doing. You have to like yourself as a person mm -hmm. and be really, you know, kind of mentally healthy and uh, help yourself, you know, not get into that author spiral where, you know, it's just all about, you know, your Amazon ranking or how the book's doing or your book scan numbers. You know, you really want to divorce yourself from that. Right. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's definitely... You know that's that's definitely good advice, and I mean it applies not just to authors. I mean I'm thinking of just stories of like, uh, you know, famous sports people who you know who let success get to their heads. Just Absolutely. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. All right then. Cool. So uh, yeah. So um, let's wrap this up. In closing, then our guest is author Melissa De La Cruz. Her book is Never After the 13th Fairy, and this will be the start of a whole new series. And you can find this on Amazon. 
So yeah, Melissa, thank you very much for being an author story. It was a, a great deal of fun being able to speak with you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right. So everyone, check out Never After and me. And, you know, sure, the series of, the, of books that come after this. And while you're at it, go right ahead and smash the subscribe button to get a gander in all the people and stories we will cover in the future. So catch you guys next time on Author Story, the home of authors and people with stories that matter.